why does uh, the UAE or the MENA region need a tabi for rent? It yeah. can be the difference between having a successful and an unsuccessful uh, startup. Hi everyone, welcome to The Real Ones. I'm your host, Joel Alexander. So today I'm joined by Walid Shahabi, the co-founder of Keeper. Um, Keeper is in the rent now, pay later space and also in the property management category, as I understand. I'm really excited for this conversation. So Walid, how are you doing? I'm super excited myself. Uh, yeah. Great to meet you, uh, Joel. I am a fan. I've, I've loved what you've uh, kicked off over here. I think the conversation space on the topic is very interesting. A lot of people would love to hear about what's new and what's innovative in the property uh, space. And I think you're taking a great lead on that uh, on that front. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And, you know, when you have a serious guest like yourself on a podcast, I have to ask you. I'm not too serious. <laughs> I do have a sense of humor. Oh, <laughs> no, trust me, trust me. We're getting there. Um, but. You know, when you have a serious guest like yourself on our podcast, uh, we make sure to ask you, what did you want to do when you were seven years old? What oh, that's become? awesome. <laughs> um, I, what I wanted to do as a seven year old, I, I was brought up in the construction industry. So okay. that was exactly what I did not want to do. Uh, if you can gotcha. imagine in, uh, in in the UAE, it's a right. tough industry, especially back in, you know, when when I was uh, growing up. And I, I always wanted to be in uh, from since I can remember, I wanted to be in the general space of engineering or finance. I like numbers. I've always been driven by uh, okay. by numbers and it ended up being finance. Uh, right. So I wasn't too far off. Uh, it wasn't a firefighter. It was a pilot for a short period of time. Wow. Uh, but Same. then from pilot to actual uh, aeronautical engineering was where I really, really fell in love and started wow. reading up, uh, but never ended up going in the engineering uh, uh, direction. No. Uh, but, but finance is as close to numbers as, as of course. engineering. I would say so that was that ended up being my path wow that's that's actually that's a really cool story so you grew up in Dubai I did grow up in Dubai yes wow so you've seen you've seen it going to go through a massive yeah I've been through all the cycles I've been through the tremendous growth in yep. the uh, in the city in the country uh, overall my father is actually here even before the union of the uh, UAE so in, wow. the, in the 60s when a lot of the infrastructure was still being built the roads the hospitals the bridges uh, etc so I was was born into that okay. and uh, not only did I see it as a spectator uh, I was actually so, so to speak involved in, uh, in in a lot of what was uh, was being uh, right. uh, was being built um, phenomenal experience you tend not to understand basically how unique it is if yeah. uh, you know if you've been in it all your uh, uh, all your life um, but the truth is it's breakneck speed what we uh, uh, what we saw and and sometimes I actually make it the intention of taking stock of taking a step back and okay go through what you've seen here there's a story there you know relive yeah. it go through it see all the progress that's been done across all industries and just how big this economy and this uh, th this country has uh, and advanced it has become right and the city is a startup right that's that's what we've seen the city's always been run like a startup I <laughs> yeah would say. exactly um yeah. and still grow th grows 100%. at the startup uh, yeah. uh, pace it's you, you know very few companies actually would live up to uh, to that maybe google maybe amazon you know but only right. though that that level of companies yeah. where, where growth is still high at a very high scale and we've not even reached like the surface of where this can be so and, and, and it's awesome yeah. that the ambition continues to be looking forward right and i think i'm very excited to see youth in the country as well take up that mantle even at the like you know whether it's the the general resident level or the citizen level like you know everyone's just like riled up and like ready to go and have this global impact if you're in so, dubai and you're yeah. not ambitious you're in the wrong place i agree yeah. i agree it's like new york or you know i mean london used to be that but i don't think less it's that london anymore. these days yeah i, would agree. I agree yes maybe yeah. singapore maybe uh, you know there's there's a few new hubs popping up also yep. that uh, where entrepreneurship is really taking hold berlin maybe i i, yep. I don't know uh, but it's that sort of energy absolutely 100 percent. so i mean you know nobody wakes up and decides to become a prop tech entrepreneur no, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i would be very surprised if someone did but uh Talk to me about your journey. It's there. a journey of personal pain yeah. points, right? And okay. it's what we're doing today is actually fed in extensively by personal, uh, professional, yeah. as well as you know related cu uh, customers, etc. Pain points and experiences in yeah. the uh, in the industry. 
Um, I, I give myself sometimes the right to speak on behalf of the industry or speak about the industry, not just because of the startup we started a couple of years ago, but by the fact that I've been involved in the real estate industry, either as a buyer, investor, or operator um, right. for maybe 20 years now. Wow. Um, yeah. So uh, it, from a personal journey, uh, journey point of view, um, one of my first personal investments was actually in real estate, and okay. that was very in Dubai. And that was very early on. You bought a house. My, I bought a property Ooh. off plan, yeah. uh, original six by Amar, Dubai Marina. Nice. The marina didn't exist. Okay. Right? They, so they were starting to dig it up, and the first freehold project in Dubai, remember somebody living in in Dubai for as long as I have, yeah. um, was the first opportunity to actually invest in real estate in Dubai. Right. And my dad encouraged me at the time. I was early in in my career and he encouraged me and actually made the first investment. Mm -hmm. uh, so he put the down payment yeah. and said, you take it from there. Yeah. So that delivered forced savings. Okay, yeah. and that delivered by, by myself. So I had to save to pay the mortgage, to pay the payment plan, you know, and of to course. lock that in. And then in the end of that, I lived in the property and then I transitioned into moving out of it and renting it out. So I became from an owner occupier to a landlord. So of I went course. through the experience of what it means to list your property, rent it out, generate an income of it, deal with land, with yep. the tenants and, and so on. And I'm not going to bore you with the rest of that story, but yeah. you know that really opened up the the understanding of. I was one of the first mortgages ever given. I'm sure. I mean, like, because yeah. I can't, I can't imagine that financing was as robust as it is. We today. were. I, I was an yeah. investment banker back in the day in okay. a company called Trial Capital, which yeah. pretty Familiar. much used to lead the local and and regional space. Um, at that time, and okay. we were involved in IPOing the first mortgage provider in the UAE. Wow! So I think I was like customer number three or four for them, um, wow. and I wanted to mortgage my uh, the uh, the property. I wanted to pay it over fifteen years. I had a salary. You know, it of all course. made sense. It was extremely painful. Uh, that the, the whole process was very opaque. It was just starting to to, to get started and. Um, but it was a learning curve yeah. also for uh, for me in that uh, in that context. Um, went through it multiple times since uh, since then, um, and then in 2013, uh, raised and invested a real estate fund. Right. So I went from a personal experience into an institutional experience right. in property acquisitions, property financing, property operations, etc. And that was also a Dubai-based uh, product. Yep. Had a lot of pain points on the uh, on on the way, and always thought there must be a better way to do this, or there must be a better way to do that, or this is just unreasonably complicated uh, for something that in my head can be made simpler. Yep. And it turns out it can using the right technology and having the right understanding of the of the asset class. Um, I was never, you know, the the biggest adopter of innovation yeah. uh, or, or technology in terms of my, our, my own IP, in terms of the development of it. I was, an ad, I was an early adopter in a lot of the technology that existed in the market, but yeah. I always was of the opinion that not enough is being done. Right. Um, and I got a boost of courage, I guess, during COVID, um, where I had an experience first advising and then being part of a startup in the real estate industry that was an extremely steep learning curve. Urban, right? Urban, yeah. correct. Okay. Um, and that was a very ambitious company. Yeah. It's a company that wanted to digitize the property leasing process end-to-end -end from payments to, to uh, negotiation to viewings to contract signing, etc. Nobody ever needs to meet anybody. Everything is digital. Everything is by app. Right. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, right. m for me, mainly because it got me deeply embedded and involved in the development of the solutions. We didn't go looking for these solutions. We built them. Of course. Okay. And it was sort of, it built the conviction in me is that we can actually build this ourselves. Even if it doesn't exist in the market, we know what needs to be built. We know how it should work. So it gave me the courage to, when I exited uh, Urban, right. to, uh, to start uh, Keeper. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't explain to you how, how happy I am to have made that jump and have made that decision because it's been a wonderful ride since then. And we have been building, yep. shipping, delivering um, on sort of the, the plan that we had in, uh, in mind. All our IP, all our development, all built by the talented uh, team that we put uh, together and all fed by the experience that we have built over decades, understanding this industry and how it could function right. better. 
Well, guys, I have to say, breaking the fourth wall for a second, <laughs> Waleed is the most PR trained <laughs> person I've ever met in my life. He's he's definitely gone on the, like, this is, this is a part where entrepreneurs describe how they are the perfect person to be building the company that they're building. And Maybe he not is. the perfect, but, you know. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, no. You, I, I, I do think that that's a phenomenal background, right? Like, as in, um, I, it's not every day that you meet someone that lived and breathed this city as it was from the start. I mean, I have a similar story in the sense that my parents came here three decades ago, and I'm not one of the crypto got rich bros that moved to Dubai. <laughs> um, and I've seen it like in that growth phase, so I understand like, you know, you seeing it from off-plan project way back when uh, to what it is now and building solutions, digital solutions for that space now. Um, and just like taking it all over the MENA region, I'm sure, um, and the rest of the world. So That's um, idea. I, I, I love that. And uh, on, on the notion of starting Keeper, talk to me about the whole co-founding uh, piece, because obviously people have this idea that every startup idea happens in some garage somewhere. So what was your garage? <laughs> um, so no, it wasn't a garage in, yeah. in our case. I, I like to say we're, we're adult founders <laughs> in a sense that, you, you know, this wasn't our, our first professional Rodeo. stint yeah. in, in, in yeah. any way. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the story is um, uh, finance has its, uh, the finance industry has its clique. Uh, you yeah. know, there's the finance bros, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was, I, yeah. I got together again with one, one, one of, uh, you, you know, a former colleague uh, yeah. of mine, a great uh, career um, banking um, uh, talent that uh, thought it was time also to start looking at something fundamentally different. So in, it was uh, at the arts club. Uh, <laughs> it was, it, you, you'd think it was close, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But it was a social gathering yeah, uh, and it was a conversation that sort of was pulled together from previous conversations mm -hmm. and, and sort of people pulled us back together, myself and, uh, and, and Omar uh, yeah. Abu Annab. And he was at the stage where um, he had done some work building a, an incubator with uh, uh, a number of other prominent uh, partners for startups right. and he was at that stage where he was going to take responsibility of one of these startups to build from the ground up okay and we had a meeting in, in order to see and this was when i exited urban and had the intention to build a company that focuses on the property uh, uh, investor on the property owner digitizing right. their experience and creating solutions around their uh, their experience and there was an instant and immediate meeting of minds. Um, part of that is because, well, obviously we knew each other, we had respect for each other, we had uh, 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 sort of worked together uh, yeah. before, um, but also at the same time, it's how our brain was built, uh, mm -hmm. right? And how we saw the opportunity was not a, a sort of a, a short-term opportunistic look at the asset class. It was more from the understanding that there's infrastructure that's going to need to be built, and it's going to need to be built based on our understanding of finance, right? right? It's about the numbers. It's about financialization of this asset class and then creating value around it. it. It's not a very clear statement, I'm sure, what we we're saying, but that was where we had instant alignment in what we wanted to, uh, to build. Um, he had great backing, so it didn't require us to go raise money right. Right at the ideation uh, stage. We had the incubating funds uh, to, to move forward on it, and it was instantly about, okay, so create the MVP for the product and identify very clearly what it is the first problem we want to solve and how it's going to start looking from, right. uh, from there. So shook hands, did the agreement on the partnership and the shares in the company, um, allocated some basic funds, got this key team members on board from product, from strategy, et cetera, build the first pitch deck and right. so on. And by January 2022, we launched commercially to the world and we launched our first digital product in February of the same year. So we're very quick to come up with a post MVP sort of product for yeah. uh, MVP, for those who don't know, is minimal viable product, right? Which is sort of the skeleton of what you want to build. Yeah. It works, but it doesn't really scale. Um, yeah. And we had that up and running by that uh, by that stage, and then started commercializing right. it in the first half of 2022. So, talk to me about shaking hands, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, people think co-founders just magically end up together after 
meeting at a gathering, shaking hands, and then it's done. But we all know that, like, I've had previous startup experiences where I, you know, just had, uh, like, you know, been screwed over by people, this and that, like, you know, you know, how I don't mean to be crass, but that's just what it is, of right? Course. And it happens in startups all the time. It's the most critical so, decision you make. It's sometimes exactly. even more critical than the industry you want to yeah. get into or, exactly. the, or the idea. It doesn't matter. It's product. about who you do it with. Some of the most successful yeah. companies have pivoted. So it's not very important what, it is important yeah. to, be, to be logical in your approach, yeah. but the most critical part is who you're partnering with exactly who you're you know you're you're getting straight into a catholic marriage so to speak, <laughs> over there. Yeah, yeah. it's uh yeah. and Messy. it might not be as strict as a yeah. catholic marriage but it, that, if it's going to end it, with you breaking up it doesn't end well at all exactly right? so, so you're going to have you... to have a lot of conviction and faith in uh, in the partner that you uh, that you have and to take it back a question do you need yeah. a co-founder and uh, that's you, you know that's where you start up right. with is so why do I need a co-founder or more or two or three yep. uh, right when you want to start a business and I can give you first-hand feedback is uh, startup two for me mm. is so much better because I have a co-founder right, uh, right. unlike startup one yeah um, I had to sort of cover areas and um, uh, skill sets and deliver on skill sets that I didn't have no. in startup one, right? right. Um, where in startup two, there is this amazing complementarity that we have uh, yep. together. I'm strong in X, you're strong in Y, and the rest of the team is, is strong in Z. We can carry the burden together. Each in their area of strength will deliver more collectively for the, uh, for the company. Um, and it's also great to have somebody to share the burden with. Yeah, I mean, right? like, it's there's so many anxiety-inducing messages, emails that you receive, whether it's from a legal perspective, competition standpoint, or um, just like, you know, hitting your timelines because they're always aggressive in startups. You're expected to bring about disproportionate returns and like, you know, it, the anticipation is high. It's right? very, very Consistently tough. high. It's, and it's, when you do it for long enough, it you know it's brutal so it's brutal it yeah. can be the difference between having a successful and an unsuccessful uh, startup it's because yeah. the burden becomes too much at, uh, at certain points in time and you're like spinning out of control you're not yeah. in control of everything that you're building and if you're grow you could be growing at a great pace but you're in control of none of it yeah um, and that's a uh, and that's a problem um, the the advantage of having a aligned complementary co-founder cannot be overstated it's not a one plus one yep. you know I, I, I know this is going to sound cliche but it is it is well past the one plus one if it's the right team if it's the right uh, matter so much um, in my first experience being a sole founder um, told you something about me in the in sort of the high self-belief I had and I can do this on my own of course right what you don't think about is the complete lack of support system that you have when you start a new company, mm. right? If you're used to being in corporate for a long time, you're used yeah. to things being done in a reasonably timely manner, in right. a reasonable quality uh, matter. You don't worry about HR necessarily or finance or, uh, you know, some of the core function that just is there yeah. for you. It, when you're the sole co-founder, you're gonna, you're the HR, you're the CFO. You're even if you start hiring for these positions, you still feel that ultimately you're responsible for for uh, for all of them, and you never have enough funding for them to be at the quality of like a large right. company. Um, and over time, it chips away at you, of course, right? at your focus, at your drive, at uh, at everything. Uh, whereby, when you have you know dependable co-founders on the middle, you split the job, you carry some of the same load together, right? Like part me, part you, you know, and we 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 yeah. see it through. When somebody is is overworked and exhausted. Somebody will carry that uh, exactly uh, forward with them. So it's I I can't emphasize it enough. It's just as bad 
getting the wrong co-founder involved oh, yeah. because that it, it becomes Kills not just uh, yeah. it, not just do you lose the the advantage that I was talking about mm -hmm. it actually takes away from your productivity also where part of your a larger uh, part of your day is conflict and politics and <laughs> politics and, and <laughs> yeah. so on and that's that's the worst possible result awesome. so i mean i think that's a very good i mean for folks that don't understand what building a startup is like this might sound like gibberish and like you know foreign speak and i totally <laughs> get that but for us i feel like you know i understand like you know it's it's very in the trenches you you get it right um talk to me about we'll just do like a little bit of a rapid fire ish in the context of like rent now pay later yeah. right why does Dubai, why does uh, the UAE or the MENA region need a tabby for rent um, to simplify for our audience, right? Uh, why do we need rent now, pay later? And how does it tie into financial services and, you know, broader property management? How do you put these kind of things together? Of course. Yeah. Well, well uh, I'll, I'll take you back to when we were identifying some of the problems. And, right. uh, and like I said, as finance people, we see numbers, yeah. right? And for us, we started looking at some key uh, elements in the market that didn't make sense to us. One of the first things that didn't make sense to us was the fact that your biggest expense as a human being, as a person living in Dubai today, which is rent, yeah. it takes up the largest component of a uh, yeah. household's uh, income, income, its biggest part of their expenditure is still paid like the stone ages you mm -hmm. write paper checks and you write pdcs going forward and, and so on and you give it to the landlord and the landlord holds on to these pieces of paper and goes to the bank and deposits them and has to remember to deposit them on time and has to make sure that you know everything on that piece of paper is uh, accurate yep. and then having to deal with bounced checks because of uh, any number of yep. uh, of reasons super inefficient super unfriendly etc and, and and it's always been one of the key things that we've looked at as as a problem right. there's tens of billions of dollars of annual rent being paid that way in dubai today right. in dubai alone i'm not even talking uae yeah. and i'm only Massive. talking residential i'm not even talking commercial retail etc pure dubai residential rental payment tens of billions of dollars being paid by these PDCs. Um, no consumer in Dubai has a checkbook for any other reason than to pay rent. Yeah. Yeah. They. Uh, how do you buy everything else in your life? You Apple do it pay. digitally. You do it by card. You do it by through via digital solutions, etc. Mm -hmm. So that in itself needed a deeper, uh, a deeper dive. And then the nature of way rent is paid over here is that because landlords wanted a degree of security about the payments in the future, yep. they ask you for a PDC and they do not want to handle 12 PDCs, right? Yeah. Like there's no Logistical interest in nightmare. handling 12 PDCs where you need to yep. remember to deposit every month and then you need to follow up on the payment for any other reason yep. uh, with the tenant on a monthly basis. No, I'll accept less. Mm -hmm. I'll accept less for fewer payments. Right. Okay. Yep. And you see it across the market. If you're paying in one, you're paying a, a smaller amount than if you're paying in two and if you're paying in mm -hmm. four, right? And there isn't much beyond four payments in right. Dubai, around 90% of rental payments in Dubai. And we did the, the, the statistics. We went and we compiled data from thousands of properties under management, took them through a three-year, four-year history, through multiple cycles to assess exactly what rents look like in Dubai. Right. And, I, and we found out, and it's from personal experience, of course, of course. but we wanted to create a, a, a bigger a data set. Yeah. Um, and you find that 90% of rents in Dubai are paid in four payments or less, which means as a tenant, you're always paying well in advance, sometimes a full year in advance, a lot of times quarter. in, uh, uh, in uh, half yearly payments, and 60% of the market pays quarterly, yeah. right? So you pay three months in advance every time. Right. I don't know about you, but I think most people get their salaries monthly, <laughs> right? So if you're yeah. spending a part of your income, you know, you're allocating a bit to groceries, a bit to schools, a bit to, I don't know, yeah. um, other consumables, some to subscriptions to your Netflix, etc. Yeah. And vast majority of them are monthly expenses, right? You yeah. even think in monthly expenses, uh, but you still have to finance your rent significantly in advance. You have to pay three months or six months of rent in advance. You have to accumulate those savings over time, or you have to go out to a bank and borrow money, yeah. or you have to tap into your savings to make these rental payments yeah all right and we looked at the numbers and we said okay would you rather pay monthly 
Like everybody said yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, would you rather pay monthly on your credit card? And like everybody raised their hands. Um, we didn't need to do the uh, um, the uh, 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 sorry the, 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 we, we didn't need to uh, post the question, yeah. uh, but we did just to get the confirmation from thousands of respondents. We knew it was going to be a yes. Yeah. That's what people, a lot of people, expatriates also that used to live elsewhere. Um, are used to paying monthly and are shocked by the fact that they need to put up a, cred a, a, a check significant amount yeah. in, in advance. But we didn't only look at the problem from the view of the tenant. We, we needed to understand why is it being done that mm -hmm. way? Why does the landlord want to receive that those PDCs and why do they still insist on that payment method? Well, the fact is, number one, most landlords in Dubai are not institutions. They don't have other payment methods. They're individuals like you and me. Right. 65% of the market of rentals in mm -hmm. Dubai is owned by individuals who are not merchants, who don't have a credit card machine, who don't have a uh, commercial yep. bank account, who don't. And the only way they, they can secure the rental income is by in a recurring fashion where they don't have to call you up and remind you to pay them every three months or, or so on PDCs. is via PDCs. Yep. So what if there was another method that secured their future payments? Or better yet, what if there was a method to pay them all upfront, which means an inherent rental insurance? Yeah. Where they give up, there's no default risk anymore for that year. They've gotten it all in advance. And a present value of money component. Very interesting, right? Like, so I was always questioning why. I get it. I get the need to secure the... Um, the interests of the landlord. Uh, but my question is, like on average, really, the occupancy rates of these properties, I don't know what they're at, but if they're between 70, 80%. They are. Yeah. They're, they're they are. These days even start edging north of 80. Exactly. Yeah. If they're edging north of 80, it's surprising to me that they need 12 months in upfront instead of even in the context of like RNPL, why not three months, just just three months? Because like reduces the capital burden on your side. Um, and then the direct debit stuff happens on a monthly. You build a credit score with the same institution. And then like eventually you don't need as, mu as much insurance with certain clients. You need more insurance for certain ones that don't have as great a credit score. Great question. Yeah. Our answer is we accommodate for all. Right. Right. Yeah. So if your preference is and you have you need a degree of assurance that, you know, these recurring payments, let's say quarterly will happen and will happen on time and are guaranteed, yeah. we'll give them to you up front. Right. Right. If you're happy with the higher return on four payments, yeah. we'll accommodate that also. Right. And we price for every spread in the system. If you're happy to accept 12. Yeah. Great then we will just facilitate the 12 payments between you and the tenant. Right. Um, in most cases, people want to secure that tenancy, want the access to the a, a larger cash um, uh, inflow, yep. um, or want to utilize the income actually to make another investment or uh, to pay down, I don't exactly. know, service fee billing for the property or so on. We make that available. So it's a financial solution that's embedded in the property owner solution that right. we uh, that we provide and we leave it up to them. We price for every single variation of so that. So what does that spread look like today and what does it mean for the average renter? So we tested the market, we yeah. tested the demand and the supply of the market and we priced based on what the market prices, right? right? What the market accepts as a difference between four payments and 12. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference today for us is 6%. Okay. Um, and in exchange for that 6%, we take a degree of default risk, obviously, right. uh, away from the landlord and we accept it uh, uh, ourselves. You got that quarter's payment and then the, the tenant defaults in the next month, yeah. you don't, as a landlord, get hurt by that default. On the contrary, we've excluded you from the uh, from suffering by it. Plus, we jump in and we amend it, right? Amend it by okay. um, either collecting uh, yeah. the, uh, the the payment and working on the collection, so you don't have to follow up, or um, uh, in very very rare cases, evicting the tenant for non-payment uh, and then replacing them. Yeah. And you've had somebody take the negative out of your experience as a landlord right. and bring you an alternative tenant in their place. In all cases, yeah. we have implemented a good strong basic tenant screening functionality into the equation. Right. We're not taking on this default risk because, you know, just simply because we're happy taking everybody's risk. 
We're yeah. taking on this default risk because there is basic checks that we've done on the tenants, yeah. okay, that you as a landlord are going to be happy yeah. accepting and bringing on board. If this tenant has been vetted by Keeper, you know that they're an income, they, they yeah. are generating an income, and that income is recurring and it is significantly higher than their rental right. um, liability. If it's beyond a certain percentage, we do not accept that tenant. Yeah. Um, we do take into consideration credit uh, status of that uh, tenant. And then there is some qualitative elements also we take into consideration, such as if the rent is a renewal and they've paid last year's rent, well, that's yeah. obviously a positive, um, as opposed to a brand new tenant, for example, right. that just moved into the country with no credit history in, yeah. uh, in the country. doesn't mean that we reject those. Of course, there's multiple other parameters that go into the equation but as an owner you would be happy with the sort of screening that we do on your behalf for the tenants that are coming on board. And you would be happy for them to pay monthly. Uh, yeah. it is, they are able to manage their cash flows. They're not having to tap into their savings or borrow in order to pay their, uh, their yeah. rent. And overall, they're not doing that because they need um, th they have a uh, sort of a liquidity problem. They are salaried uh, uh, employees that yep. have a recurring income that we right. can verify. Right. So assuming debt gets expensive, um, and I, I, I can see the property management angle now, because you need to justify the premium when debt does get expensive. And one way to do it is providing a phenomenal service that people are hooked on to. Service is critical. Yep. And uh, like I said, we saw this as one of the problems that stem mm. from property investment and property ownership that we wanted to solve for. Yep. But we're looking at it in a relatively holistic way for property uh, investors. Yep. There's multiple other solutions out there that we will launch for the property investor. Um, but this turned out to be a critical one. Everybody from What's the it? supply side to the demand side agreed that yeah. we have been waiting for the solution. Right. And hence why it takes a lot of our attention, uh, hence why we've built significantly for it, and, and hence why um, we've also now built a balance sheet in order to m make that a, uh, a reality. Yeah. While we're the property manager, is because we need to own that transaction, Yeah. right? We need to source the tenant, we need to, uh, vet the tenant and then we need to retain the tenant in the property collect yeah. on behalf of the landlord and only a property manager effectively can be collecting rent on behalf of a uh, landlord right. um, we also embed ourselves in the property so today um, let's say you've rented out your property with us on four payments your tenants paying in four you're receiving in four we're embedding it in such a way that at any point during that tenancy you can ask for your money yeah. in advance so it becomes a great cash out solution for landlords. Yeah. And that is actually proven to be quite positive. It's a finance source that you didn't have before. You're tapping into future cash flows that you know you would have not been able to tap into before. But at the same time, we're also allowing for tenants that are vetted and screened and pre-approved yeah. at any point in time in their tenancy, press this button, spread your rent in 12, pay it in 12. Yeah. You can only do it via digital rental methods right right that's why we had to build the infrastructure for digital rents first we've embedded credit card payments debit card payments and if you saw a recent announcement that we did direct debits direct debit which yeah. is a somewhat misunderstood but phenomenal solution for rental payment mm -hmm. um, it is because it is recurring yeah. we can establish every fifth of the month we go to your account deduct a pre-approved pre-established amount and it is transparent it's instant landlord will know the payment has happened at the time that it has happened tenant will know that it's passed through and us as a property manager right. uh, does too and it's cheaper to process yeah. than credit and uh, sorry credit cards and debit cards yeah. what it doesn't in, uh, include though is what a credit card includes which is also embedded further financing right so i see four pillars really um over here and i'm sure this is already your roadmap but effectively financial services in the context of rnpl and things like that um with all these lovely like credit card payments direct debit etc then you've got asset management which would be the fact that all these the occupancy rates on these properties are probably higher because it's more convenient to live there. Um, and then third one being community in a way, 
right? Um, and I think you see where I'm going with this, like probably more on the uh, we work Adam Newman flow <laughs> direction. Um, and then obviously like, you know, just the standardized experience that you get with branded property management. Um, do you see that as, so Adam Newman's approach to this is let's go and buy up a bunch of buildings, manage them, create a POC, and then probably run joint ventures with like a bunch of different landlords. Um, is that something that Keeper is probably going to do? Well, the one reason why Adam Newman would be able yeah. to make such a proposition is that Adam Newman has a massive access to funding. Yeah. Right? $500 million. $500 million. Yeah. Uh, if you start with the assumption that I have access to $500 million, you start with an, in a different place. Yeah. Um, in our case, we do we are asset heavy in some senses by providing the bridge between the tenant and the landlord. Right. Um, and we really like that space, and we understand it, and we understand the underlying risk of it, and uh, and so on. Um, but I wouldn't go as far as being the owner of the property, as yeah. acquiring the property. The beauty of property management is that it gives you owner rights without owner liabilities. Right. Right. And yeah. that is the enablement that we want to right. incorporate because that's scalable. It's scalable. Yeah. It is. Is a techno a lot of it is automated by yep. the way can be automated the way it's done today by major by most of the providers in the industry is not yep. which means that it's resource heavy um, but we're building the automation around property management right uh, first being the reporting side yep. so to the landlord give them complete and utter transparency beyond anything that they've ever seen. We'll not just tell them that, you know, your property is rented for this much and your next payment is on that date. We take them through basically full education of the market, content provision, um, live valuations of their properties, a, a live feed of all comparable similar transactions in the market so if right. you own a one bedroom property that you're That's renting like, out in the yeah. following tower yeah. you will know when every one bedroom property in that tower sells so you're on top of that market entirely we embed financial solutions for you that you can tap into at any point in time digital document library we've digitized your whole engagement and interaction yep. with your property and with your property manager we do the same on the tenant side also and then we automate a whole lot of it we bring in vendors from outside plug them into the system they provide the services we track them we ensure that they're providing the services within the sla time periods within the quality uh, sort of standards that we put in place but this is a scalable right solution it's data in uh, driven it's data fed um, it is completely embedded and integrated in the properties and the financials of these uh, yeah. properties so you know i think we've, we've changed the game significantly on it but in order to be able to have that level of access and that level of monetization and financialization on a portfolio we need to manage it right that's what gives you that ultimate access to right um the uh, the asset class so three final questions and we have uh you know a shortage on time so i'm just gonna run through them one being if you do this right keeper will become a unicorn what does being a unicorn mean to you um i i think it's everybody's ultimate uh track right um, but I'm going to take you back to a period where I used to be in banking, okay? And my the most exciting time in my life is when a company we are working on is going IPO, yeah, is listing course. on the market. Yeah. That is by far the most interesting thing that can happen. So if you ask me what the optimal outcome, and it's probably similar with a lot of people building a, uh, a product, course. is... Um, is bring it to a stage where it is publicly available, where it's publicly listed, where it can be one of those companies that you mention as a national champion that sold, that brought something new, valuable to the market that people refer to as yeah. a success story. I think that's the unicorn by my definition. Of course, most people will tell you that you get a valuation of a billion dollars in the uh, in the market or so on. Some people will refer to revenue levels on that that get you there. So if you generate a billion no. dollars in revenue, maybe you're a unicorn no. then. Um, for me, that would be the optimal um, yeah. outcome. There's not been many unicorns such as that come out of the Middle East. I think maybe three actually went mm -hmm. to IPO mm -hmm. that I can uh, that I can think of. 
Um, but I think we can have a multiple of that number uh, come through um, if the infrastructure is in place and if, if what I see in some of the, uh, the, the people a few years ahead of us yeah. look like they're in, uh, in direction too. So Tabi, for example, would be such a, yeah. uh, a, an example. I think they're on track to list in Saudi Arabia within the next 12 months. Everybody should keep an eye on that one. Of course, I'm sure. And like, you know, the, I see a lot more other early stage businesses, more private businesses that are going to, you know, go ahead and tap that within the next, because, you know, it's tech maturity is catching up, right? Tech maturity to business that's been working really well is catching up. And that's what businesses like Keeper um, and several other people that are coming on this podcast, for instance, are doing. Um, tell me one thing about life that, you think most people don't understand. Let's move away from real estate for a second. Sure. What do, what do you, what's that one thing that you wake up and you'll preach to the choir that most people don't understand about life? Hmm. Um, pay the piper, I think. It's make the effort to learn yeah. first, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people assume to know something mm -hmm. and are comfortable with that level of knowledge for years mm -hmm. without pushing it along. Um, one of the key things and one of the key messages I keep pushing out there is take the time to learn. Take the time to learn. Take the time to understand the problem. Don't take it from, you know, surface level. And this, I think, is specific maybe to founders and startups and, and so on. When they think they understand the problem, in most cases I've seen, it's a superficial understanding. Yeah. Um, and I would say take the time to delve deep into the nuts and bolts uh, of the problem to understand the drivers behind it. Yeah. It exists for a reason. It's because people maybe are used to it and are used to a bad way of doing things, but that's a lazy explanation. Assumption. That's yeah. a lazy assumption. Yeah. Go, through, um, go through the flow mm -hmm. end to end. Watch it. Don't influence it. Right and see why people make the decisions that they make and why it goes in this direction, why it falls off a cliff, you know, uh, and then make your uh, conclusions that way. Don't assume to know. Definitely read other people's experiences. I live on podcasts these days. And I live on reading <laughs> I'm sorry. Audio books and, no, I, I think it's one of the greatest. Uh, it because it plugs into periods where I weren't useful for me before and mm. now are uh, useful. Yeah. When I'm driving, for example, yeah. uh, it was wasted time previously. And today yeah. it is actually one of the best educational times of, uh, of my career. Um, don't be afraid of technology. Adopt it. Understand it. Even if it makes you look stupid initially, you know, what you're, what, where you're getting stuck, um, you will be left behind yeah. by what's happening. 100%. It's it's inevitable if you're not ke trying to keep uh, to keep track of it. So the key one from Malik Shahabi is understand the causes of things. Yes. LSE, you're gonna pay me for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thirty seconds on this one. What advice would you give your twenty one year old self? Oh wow. Um, be a little bit more open, mm. okay, and uh, be a little bit more flexible with your opinion. Mm. You don't know everything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just know that you don't know everything and listen. Right. Awesome. Well, I, I don't think we could have had a better ending to this podcast. So, Walid, thank you for coming on this episode of The Real Ones. Um, to all of our listeners that tuned in and, you know, we took you everywhere from, you know, Adam Newman all the way to the nuances of the Dubai real estate market uh, through to what the future of, uh, you know, property management might look like and uh, how financial services impact your day to day. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful, uh, obviously, to get that degree of insight from someone who's building it uh, for the market and for something that I hope personally as a renter would be a household name in that case um so yeah if you enjoyed this episode like comment subscribe depending on which platform you're listening to this on and um come back for the next episode with another phenomenal guest that we've got lined up thank you Alid. thank you so much i really enjoyed this and i look forward to the uh, to the next one absolutely mm -hmm.